This is actually two talks. When I decided I wanted to talk on this topic, I, I knew sort of what I wanted to say, and it turned out I wanted to say two different kinds of things, both of which relate to big data and astronomy, but one part of it is what does big data and astronomy mean to astronomers and what does it mean to us uh, as amateurs and people who aren't working day to day. Um, and I've tried to put those two things together. And of course, my wife's recommendation is, well, find 10 good slides and practice your presentation. I didn't listen to either of those. I've got 28 slides, and I haven't practiced my presentation. So we'll see what comes out. That's a dangerous thing to admit in the beginning. What's that? That's a dangerous thing to admit in the beginning. Well, that's my excuse. Okay. Uh, so the first part of it is, um, what is big data? Because it's, it's just become a buzzword, but I want to put it in the context. And um, how did we get here with big data and astronomy, and what has it meant over time? Um, and then what actually is out there as far as big data, and um, how might it affect us as amateurs, or how might we contribute? How might we benefit from it, and how might we uh, contribute to the profession, as astronomer, amateur astronomers often try to do? Uh, it's being projected very differently than what I see, so. But starting off with what is it? Uh, it's not just the data to be meaningful. Big data is certainly a lot of data. It probably is generally more data than people can conveniently manipulate individually or even in, in fairly large collections. It's when data is coming in at a rate faster than you can easily assimilate it and figure out what to do with it. But more important than the data itself, if it's going to be meaningful, you need standards and tools by which to access it and manipulate it. Because we always talk about the inundation of data that floats around us, but a lot of data doesn't mean information. And a lot of data that you can't find is no good to anyone. So in coming up through history with ways to handle data which always exceeded the number of astronomers who were able to process it, it's always important to have standards and tools. Uh, my, my personal observation is that astronomy was not one of the best areas for adopting standards and tools. Uh, on the one hand, there was very little opportunity for people to profit off proprietary systems. So when things became available, they did become widely available to the community. On the other hand, a lot of astronomers are just plain weird. And they want to keep, both for good and bad reasons, they want to keep their data to themselves. A war story from Hubble, there was a professor at University of Wisconsin who, in conjunction with Cray, had uh, made a special scanner in which he could measure directly proper motions of stars from a pair of plates. And he had created a catalog of proper motions. When the Space Telescope Institute wanted to use that catalog in order to propagate star positions to the epoch of Hubble and asked for his raw data, or his data on tape or cards, which it was at the time, he said, no, you can copy it from the book. And the book was Astrophysical Journal Supplement Series, hundreds of pages of printed text. And he said, if you want it, that's all you can have. I published it, that's the end of it. And there were not a few people like that in the astronomical community who wanted to hold their data. There are stories throughout history. People had time on Palomar, or had time at Wilson. They had their observations, and they were keeping them. Uh, what's that? It's their line. It's their livelihood, yeah, right? <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> you keep your own rocks and you don't share. Um, so, the the goal that we're trying to get with this data, um, which is maybe different from individual observations, is we've got a lot of it out there. Now we have to learn look for patterns, which were not previously obvious, and look for outliers, because now that we've collected a lot of globular clusters, 
To some extent, we want the statistics of globular clusters, but we also want to see if any of them don't fit the pattern. So we identify new things. So looking for patterns and discovering anomalies. Now astronomical data is to some extent easier than a lot of other things because it's all remotely sensed, almost all, forgetting about planetary. And what we have is some intensity which changes as a function of time, direction, latitude, longitude, or right ascension, declination, wavelength, and sometimes polarization. In the case of the radio guys, they also have an amplitude and a phase, doesn't matter much. But we have a lot of measurements of brightnesses of things, basically. And sometimes they're individual brightnesses measured by a photometer, and sometimes they're pictures, which is an array of brightnesses. But to that extent, it's all fairly uniform. We've got pictures and we've got time series. And sometimes we do a point as a function of wavelength, and that's a spectrum. Sometimes we do as a, a point as a function of time, and that's a variable star curve or an eclipsing binary. Um, but there are a limited number of ways in which the data can structure itself, which is different from a lot of things that are around us when you can count chairs and say, I have a thing that's a chair, and I can count buildings, and I can count people, and I can look at cells and people, and I have hierarchies of things which are very complicated. Astronomy is relatively easy. The hard part is it's outside of common experience. You go outside, you say, I see, well, I can see 4,000 stars, and I sort of know what those are. But then you get to the weird things. What exactly do you mean when you discover the first globular? Well, of course, when it was first discovered, it was just something fuzzy, and the resolution got better, and they said, well, no, it's a lot of points. So you have to make a lot of records of how it was you made that observation, and that's generally what we call metadata. And metadata uh, has a couple of different parts to it. One is simply how do you read the data, its organization and representation. Um, in the case of a picture, it's sort of obvious, but actually you've got a piece of metadata which is the thing that says .jpg or .gif that tells a computer what, how to read it, how to read the x's and y's and brightness. So somehow you have to capture that. You have to say what it is you think you were doing, what it is you thought you were looking at. Um, you probably give the direction you were looking and the time you were looking so you can look for it that way. Who it was who created it, identifying if you have a question, who do you go to? So the data is not just left someplace on a post-it note on somebody's computer and, you know, here's a picture, use it. You want to know who to go ask, who took it, was the person responsible? Did he know what he was talking about? When he said it was a photograph of the Ring Nebula, was it the Ring Nebula? Was it some other planetary? And provenance, which is the history of how it's been manipulated. Because even once I get a picture, um, like I asked Bob this afternoon, he had this beautiful picture of the Ring Nebula. Um, was that with filters or not? Looking at it, I can't tell if it was filters. And he explained it was with a modified standard camera, not using filters. Um, I think it was in last year's talk, I put up an array of 24 or 30 different pictures of the Rosette Nebula, just pulled off the web, that all looked different. They were all identifiable as being the Rosette, but these things were just pulled off of um, um, Wikipedia images with no identification how they were done. And, and I know basically what happened. 30 different people took these pictures and they adjusted the colors to make them look good to their view. And that, for scientific purposes, is almost useless because you don't know what that picture means, unless I happen to look for a structured thing. So in astronomical data, we have fairly well-structured brightnesses and we have a need for fairly complicated metadata. And the side comment is, of course, everybody here, when they go out observing, they take their observing log and they make a sketch of what they're looking at and they write the time they took their picture and the time of the observation. So 20 years from now, when it turns out you have a prediscovery image of a supernova, you can get the Nobel Prize because you can prove that you took it at AHP on a pretty clear night. Anyway. Okay. 
a little bit more. One of the differences between astronomical data flows and, and, and sort of what they taught you is the scientific method in, uh, looking for my pointer. In high school, in experimental science, you start knowing something, you come up with a, at least according to the rules, you come up with a hypothesis, you design an experiment that gives you some data, you analyze the data and you improve your knowledge. And it's a nice linear flow. And the main thing is, you get to control your experiment over here. In general, you're doing chemistry or physics, things, things like that in the lab. In natural science, which is one of the things in astronomy, you don't have an experiment, really. We, we say we have experiments. But you can't go out and hit the star with a comet at a time of your choosing to see what happens. You sit around and you make observations and you try to classify the observations and you try to figure out what's going on. And of course, it's been a very slow evolution from ancient times of visual observations when people looked up and tried to figure out what the heck was going on with these things going back and forth this way. They couldn't control anything. It was a mystery. They collected observations. But you do have hypotheses you look at data, and what, what you really have is you have sort of two groups of people. In some sense, these are the theoreticians, and these are the observationalists, where some guys are out there collecting data, and some guys are out there interpreting it. Sometimes they're the same by, by the nature of things. Some people are better at this part, and some people are better at this part. But what's important is for the people doing this part and this part to be able to communicate well is you have to explain exactly what you did in this observation. And here again, we've got the metadata. You have to say how you collected it. And just by the fact that I collect a lot of it doesn't mean it's better if I don't understand it. So the, the observations themselves and the way in which they were taken go into the data. And then hopefully, the guys running this loop will be able to interpret the data and by the way, they'll come up with some analyst analysis that says, if you can, I need more observations along this way. And that has sort of been what has led to the large data because people have realized over the past, let's say, 20 years that big collections of data have been missing in astronomy. A lot of people come up and say, I want to make a telescope. I want to look at this particular problem. Uh, the the um, the 200 inch in particular was intended to solve the problem of the nature of external galaxies. It was really designed for one problem. Hubble actually was designed. The primary problem in, in astrophysics was what is the age and expansion rate of the universe. That was the primary cosmological problem. It does a lot of other things, but when they ranked ordered, what is it we really don't understand? The issue was the scale and acceleration or deceleration of the universe to find out if it's open or closed, which led to the, the dark matter and, and uh, uh, unexplained forces. So um, the, the theoreticians can inform the priorities of observation. And then you do the observations and you feed it back. OK, so a little bit more about how the history of this, this came about. Somebody like Tycho Brahe. Uh, was at the epitome of naked eye observations. He was, he was a little bit before Galileo. And uh, he was a rich guy who built an observatory in Denmark and uh, made huge observations of the planets. Um, for some reason, I was able to find a picture of the bound editions, but I've never found a picture of the pages open to see exactly what his recorded observations look like. But he recorded a lot of observations from which Kepler figured out something among all those dots, and I've got another one coming up, that led to Kepler's model of, of the solar system. He said, the only way I can simply explain what's going on with the motions of the planets, including the retrograde, which is the, the most significant, is to say that the planets are going around the sun. Actually, he thought that the planets, except the Earth, were going around the sun, and the sun was going around the Earth. It turns out 
in his kind of mechanics, it makes no difference. Uh, they're, they're geometrically equivalent, as long as you get the sign of rotation correct. So um, basically, Kepler came up with what we now call uh, a, a precursor to the Copernican theory of the solar system. And the, the random observations he, were a, he was able to make, not random, but the non-continuous, but getting all of it together, was able to be explained by Kepler, who was able to show that geometrically what made sense was that everything went around the sun, or its equivalent. This is a chart where, with a modern uh, calculation of what Mars would look like in declination fit to Tycho Brahe's original data. So by, by 1600, he had confirmation from this data set. When he went into it, he didn't know what he was going to come out with. He just observed everything in the sky because the people at that time were trying to understand, largely for a, theoretical, a, a theological reason, why things behaved the way they did. Were comets as far away as the stars, or were they close? Actually, for theological reasons, they wanted to believe they were close. Um, meteors also, they wanted to believe were close. Mars, they were willing to believe was far away, but they still couldn't explain the motion. Uh, I don't expect you to be able to read this, but this, this sort of breaks up the kind of things we see in terms of, of what era of observation they could be examined. So we had basically the naked eye era before 1600, the telescope era starting with Galileo, photography and spectroscopy beginning about 1880 uh, as a practical matter, radio IR, UV, X-ray, and gamma rays beginning about 1940, 1950, and CCDs and the ability to collect vast amounts of data. Most of these are uh, collecting points are only small regions. Um, the CCDs and the surveys going out into space and some other things are allowing us to collect huge amounts of data all at one time. And with that, you're finding the kind of things are the more oddball and difficult and hard to find things, like Kuiper belt and Oort cloud, things very far out, uh, exoplanets, galactic clusters and structures, that video that I was showing at the beginning, um, and the structure and history of the universe. And these things all depend on examinations of massive amounts of data, most of which is meaningless. So you've got to find the gems inside all that data. So the flow is you start with data, you pass it through. This is showing up. Blue is sort of processes and black is sort of things. You process it through standards and tools so you get it organized so it's discoverable and modifiable. You analyze it. Now you get a little bit of information from a large amount of data. Uh, then a couple of places you have to apply some creative thinking because you can't automate all this to come up with new hypotheses and some more creative thinking to get the data needs and you're back up at the top. So people are working on mainly the first two and hoping to get the rest to follow. Uh, this is, it doesn't show, this is actually a, a chart that's derived from one of my wife's management professors. One of the other problems we have is not or, only organizing the data, but finding in the midst of all the good data, the defects. This was a family rated one, so it doesn't say bullshit, it says bull bits, but um, not everything that's collected is right, as we had a lot of discussions about calibration of images and things like that. Just because I have something that looks like data doesn't mean it's valid. And again, if you have good metadata, you can help confirm and have confidence in the quality of the data and the information derived from it. So we've got to organize the data and we've got to get a get the bad stuff out. Getting the bad stuff out is also something that requires creative thinking. There's no way to automate it. So where the data is being collected? One of the things that's going on is place at Harvard and at other places, they're beginning to scan all the old plates. 
Harvard, oops, that was supposed to be a video. Let me jump out of this and just, uh, sorry. This is a short video. This is a machine. Harvard has a hundred years, more than a hundred years of photographic plates, uh, which have primarily value for variable star work. And most of them were analyzed by hand as they were made. They were also part of a project called Carte du Ciel, which was intended to photograph the entire sky. The project lasted about 70 years and never was completed. But Harvard both at its main observatory and at field sites in the southern hemisphere um, for a period of most of a hundred years from about 1870 to 1970 took thousands of plates and they have something like 70,000 plates in their collection, 70, 80,000, of which with this machine now 55,000 have been scanned and I think the number was 55 million uh, photometric measurements from it. So that's one way in which massive data can get to our uh, repositories. And one of the things I found interesting in uh, Dave Dvorkin's talk yesterday when he, he was trying to locate that um, uh, Super Schmidt plate, they had scratched on the edge an identification number which he can use to look in the written records and he will be able to find exactly the date and time and place at which that image was taken because they were pretty good about keeping records. So yeah, they've scanned, of their plate collection, they've scanned 55,000 from which they have 3.3 billion individual star magnitude estimates and that data will be available for looking for unexpected light curves, both periodic and aperiodic. Because what they did was they've taken each of these plates and they take CCDs and mosaic them together and calibrate them the best they can after the fact, such that they'll have a repository. Most of the data, though, comes from both deep and broad surveys. Radio astronomy is going deeper and deeper and with very large array and other large projects, uh, the resolution of radio telescopes now can exceed the resolution of optical telescopes. They're tunable, so not only do you get the images in space, but you get the images in wavelength in a way which is almost easier than filter photometry with, uh, with a telescope. Uh, there are the very large surveys not too easy to see, but lower right is a, is a map of the Sloan Digital uh, Sky Survey, which from New Mexico has been cataloging the sky every night, and it's clear almost every night there. As it drifts by, it takes uh, Sloan's in five bands, I think, of color imagery at very high resolution, so you can zoom in on all of these. Uh, and it looks for things which change from night to night. So it's finding variables, it's finding asteroids, it's finding potential planetary occultations and pairs, it's finding uh, external supernovae, uh, it's finding meteors, not too many because of the way it scans, it finds airplanes, um, and a lot of their problem is the pre-processing to take the junk out and leave a time series of images. But that is a repository for examination. The uh, upper left is, uh, I forget the gentleman's name, somebody who made his own photographic survey of the entire sky in, uh, in five band color, um, just as a, his own initiative. He sells, he sells the product commercially, 
but just sort of as a hobby, he's collected the entire sky. There are also the deep surveys, like the, like the Hubble Ultra Deep, ultra deep Field, um, which don't give a total view of the universe, but in one small area, it shows you every kind of thing which is possible to detect in that kind of a region, so it becomes a galaxy zoo. And it, as you look further back at the fainter galaxies, you see uh, galaxies closer to the beginning of the universe. So this is a list of some of the current resources which are out there. Uh, obviously, you don't have to pay attention to it. It just points out the fact there are all kinds of different wavelength bands. Most of these, I think all of these, may be either total sky information or large fractions of the sky, something approaching the entire sky so that the various bands can be compared. Now the trick is, how do you put all these things together? And starting about, uh, I guess it was about 10 years ago, the US national observatories got together partially because their data had to be made public and made available to everyone to come up with ways in which it could be exchanged. And the current list of participants on the US side, what's now called the Virtual Astronomical Observatory, what it was originally called the um, National Virtual Observatory. Uh, this is where all the major radio telescopes, optical telescopes, reside as far as management and also some of the uh, information technology places. Um, JPL's uh, IPAC, NCSA um, first, which was mentioned today in the uh, gamma ray burst talk, um, which archives all the high energy data. So these guys all got together and said, we have to come up with a way in which we can find each other's data in order, in order to make it worth all the money we spent collecting it. These guys also are the ones who collect all or essentially all of the space data. Um, under the National Virtual Observatory, it was funded just by NSF. Now it's funded by NSF and NASA. And they have a bunch of, uh, and it's managed by Aura and Associated Universities. So Aura is the Kitt Peak Space Telescope people and associated universities, the NRAO and, and, and the uh, radio management organizations, both of which are, are uh, college consortia. So the board of directors is in effect, the colleges who use it. The idea was expanded to an international virtual observatory when they got all these countries, I don't know if you can read them, to sign up and participate also. Now, the, I, I didn't get, I didn't find much information about the level of participation of each of these places. It's fairly easy to see that most of the, the holdings of these people is available through this process. I don't know how much of this information is. Certainly the UK and France and Germany participate actively. Uh, and they're participating not only by exposing their data through the International Virtual Observatory, but also by getting their good computer geeks to work on standards and tools. The most important thing is to identify the means by which a portal, a place you log on to, can find the data at all the observatories. One of the things which I find most amazing that the, that the French did, straightforward, that's a lot of work, is they've come up basically with a thesaurus of all the different names by which things are known. And you'll see that later on when I pull up some of the, some of the images. Because things are known by a great variety of names. Uh, you've got the, the Messier name. Everything with a Messier name just about has an NGC name or maybe an IC name. If it's associated with a, uh, a radio source, it may have a 3C name and then it will have its X-ray name. And when these things were discovered, they may not have realized the association. The other problem is when you start getting to right ascension and declination, you have to pay attention to whose version of it. Was it 
right ascension and declination as of 1950 or as of 2000 or of some other epoch. And you have to put some error bars on it. Because sometimes when you say, I saw an object at such and such a location, you may not have had a very good um, ability to estimate, especially in the non-visible and IR. An x-ray burster uh, may be identified only to a degree or so. So I'm going to be looking for extremely blue stars in the vicinity in this two degree circle. And I may or may not have other information. So they've worked this out. You can type in just about any kind of a name for a thing. It goes to an observatory in Strasbourg where there's a server that knows how to convert that into a standard identifier. And then pass that out to all the participants and with other criteria, you ask the participants, what have you got for this object? Uh, I'm not sure this is, well, it'll be a bit of a break to the example, but given that, given that this information is now discoverable, how does it get to an amateur and what can we do with it? So one of the things is you can always just browse the data. You can use it for your observing. Some of the systems are hooked up so you can do telescope control associated with it. We'll get to that later over a telescope. Uh, if you're aggressive, you can pull down data and do your own kind of research. You can pull down a series of brightness measurements of a star and apply software that looks for periodicity and see if it's an undiscovered uh, variable star. Uh, you can let scientists use your computer resources so that they can crunch the numbers on yours. I'll give some examples of that. Or you can do citizen science, um, where you specifically sign up to do a job with the professionals going through this data. So the first thing is the easy access and browsing it. Uh, both Google Sky and the Worldwide Telescope actually have back ends which interface with the Virtual Astronomical Observatory. So they're pulling that information out when you start going down into it. Now I think the Worldwide Telescope probably got started earlier and deeper with the IBO standards. Because Microsoft early on sent, or I don't know if they sent, Microsoft had some of their fellows, the people who can do whatever they want, who became interested in this project and this problem. Um, and worked extensively with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey people and the developers of Worldwide Telescope to make the whole thing work together. And eventually Worldwide Telescope was picked up by Microsoft, so it's operated by them. Google Sky has some of the same features, but when you go to Worldwide Telescope and start drilling down, you can get to the, observ to the data which resides around the web at the observatories through IVO. Other ways, more crude, but allowing you to get raw data of more kinds, are various portals. So there's Skyview um, from NASA and Smithsonian, which has access to degrees their gamma, UV, visual, IR, and radio, um, both direct measurements and some scan plates. From the, the scan plates from Smithsonian and Harvard are going into Skyview. The Naval Observatory has their own also um, called the Integrated Image and Catalog Archive Service. Uh, and they've, they've scanned some of their Schmidt plates and Naval Observatory catalogs, including both their most advanced astrometric catalogs and the data which they collected at the Flagstaff Field Station over the years. Um, AstroPix is a repository of public imagery, Google Sky and Worldwide Telescope, uh, you just saw. And on the right, by the way, is, is some of, when you zoom all the way out to the entire sky, you can see some of this data mosaic together, which is another nice feature. Even though this was taken as individual little snapshots, the mosaics are there. And just as, you're, as everyone's getting used to, you can just zoom in to your object of interest. You can also line things up. So you can take a radio observation, line it up with x-ray see where the things are at the same location where they're not. This is the front end of the Virtual Astronomical Observatory, and I don't, I don't expect you to, uh, to see the details, but 
all that happened here, all I did here was I typed in M57 with a two degree search radius. And it popped up all these data sets. These are not images, these are individual collections on the web, all of which have some information relating to the area within 0.2 degrees of M57. So then, uh, and it, it says the name of the data set, uh, a short name, the wavelength band involved. Most of these are optical. Um, and you can set various criteria here, wavelength bands, what kind of data set you're interested, a catalog, an image, a spectrum. And if you have specific, you know specific kinds of repositories, you can indicate that here or where it's held. Clicking on one of them from Hubble, this is now a beginning of some huge number of pages of individual images of the Ring Nebula, uh, which, by the way, it translated to NGC 6720, which is the way it knows it. Um, Uh, and it gives you a thumbnail, and it gives you a local a localization. Um, I assume everyone's sort of familiar. This is this is the WIF pick uh, shape. That's the, the field of view of white field project camera, um, which takes that bat wing shape. So these are these are the beginning of some of the observations from Hubble. Some of them in one band. Some of them in full color or pseudo color, I don't know where these combinations come from. And you can go down, you can, there's a little icon to save it, there's a little icon for information about it. And you can just go in, anybody can go in and get information about any object you want to study, or look at, or process. I, I don't know if anybody's tried it, but you could try some of the processing techniques which you'd love to be able to do with your own photography, and take Hubble photography. You can get narrow band images, so you can go through whatever combination sets and just make whatever pretty pictures you want. Um, WIFPIC has about 26 filters on it. You can pick the ones you want, try combinations, make art, whatever. So on cloudy nights, don't say you've got nothing to do with that. <laughs> go shopping. <laughs> or maybe I shouldn't tell anybody's spouses about this thing. The answer is not to buy it a vacation to Arizona. Now, the other part is, um, another part is citizen science, where you can go and, under the direction of, of uh, <coughs> major programs, I don't know if major programs, but uh, professional programs, help the professionals look at this data, because there's more data than the professionals can look at. Zooniverse uh, started out, I think, with this. I'm, I'm pointing to my screen. That's Sorry. Right. That doesn't work very well. Um, uh, a galaxy classification, Galaxy Zoo, uh, and has expanded because we're so successful to other programs looking for phenomena on the moon, looking for things on the sun, looking for exoplanets by looking for by creating light curves. Um, so you just go to zooniverse.org. They also have some non-astronomical projects. They have biological projects, oceanography projects. So these are people who want your brains and eyeballs to look at the data, go through some training first, look at the data. They've got lists and lists and lists of things which have to be looked at or areas which have to be searched. Um, and I just pulled out some of the examples of uh, astronomical related projects they have. There are also some which don't involve your active participation, but just leaving your computer on at night or when you're not using it. Uh, Boink, B-O-I-N-C. Berkeley created what is believed to be a secure, reputable method for you to turn over your CPU to these programs. The, the programs are operated by individual institutions, independent of Berkeley. But they have to go through Berkeley's software to access your machine and swipe machine cycles. 
So right now, I'm running Asteroids at Home and um, uh, Einstein at Home. Einstein at Home is looking, for gra is looking at gravity wave data for signals of coherent um, black hole and whatever creates gravity waves. They have a lot of, it's not actually astronomical data, it's actually laser interferometer data, <coughs> but they have to look through it to see if there's something that happened both in Massachusetts and Louisiana at the same time and therefore is believed to be a gravity wave. Um, asteroids at home is looking at light curves of asteroids to see if you can figure out the geometry over the period um, and relative albedo of the various projections and also precession of, of asteroids, which is an interesting topic. And there, and there are others too. Um, these are a little bit different. SETI Live is looking for SETI signals. It's not the same as SETI at home, um, which is the grandpappy of these projects, looking for intelligent signals. This is specifically from the Allen Radio Array. They run in their own, looking for signals. Uh, and then Stardust at home was also very early, where they've taken micro photographs of gel, which was in the, uh, um, the name of the spacecraft, but the spacecraft that passed through Comet Wheel 2, um, and picked up, hopefully, pieces of cometary dust. The problem is the dust is enmeshed in a bunch of gel. They automatically sliced the gel and took pictures and cataloged it. Now they need people to look at the photographs and find the tiny granules, if they exist, of cometary material so that they can then go back to the slices of gel and dig them out with a tweezer or whatever they do. So this, these, um, this one is looking for eyeballs again. And this has been going on for a long time. This is phase six. I think the first few phases were gels which were exposed before it got to the comet. So they could work out how to evaluate the volunteer uh, examiners. Certainly by having at least two people look at every picture. But they've, they've worked out procedures and they now have high confidence that if they actually start showing people the real deal, the cells, which, the gels which are exposed when they pass through the tail of a comet, that they'll get high quality and high confidence in the results. And that's about it. I don't have any thrilling wrap up, but there's a lot of data out there. People are getting a lot better at tracking it and exchanging it. And now the good news is if you want, you can, you can participate and you can help. Are there any, res I'm sorry. Are there any restrictions on the usage of the Hubble data? Like you have to use no, the Hubble data. Well, th there's. Um, they ask for they ask for attribution. Um, it doesn't get released. The original policy I know of was it does get released for twelve months. The PI gets the data for twelve months. We get his, we get his stuff in a year, and if if he wants to make a discovery, then it's it was bought by the taxpayer. That's my attitude. They do ask for attribution, and there's a very long winded attribution. It's NASA and ESA and Barbara Mikulski, and you have to say thank you to everybody. But I think most people just say Hubble imagery. Um, and even if you do value added to it, you still have to say. But it's not copyrighted. And the data comes from the tree. Um, I, I, I can't make a broad statement on all the data sources. Um, in general, the data is being exposed for community use. The only time I think it would be a real problem if, if somebody's been doing commercial and it wasn't public domain stuff. A lot of the reasons the Hubble stuff shows up in semi-commercial stuff is because it's public domain and they can't charge. Um, I would be willing to bet that the Europeans do not have that attitude. No, they, no, they, they charge for everything. Yes. Um, and that's fair. I mean, American taxpayers could not pay for, for their data. Anything else? Anything
things like things like Kepler that was drawing down so much data, and there's other other satellites out there and other systems out there that are just capturing terabytes of data a day. Where, where does that get stored? I don't mean where, but does that well, become a problem storing and accessing and retrieving that that much data? Luckily, my my understanding is that as long as Moore's law for data is steeper than Moore's law for computation, <laughs> we're okay. okay. Um, the, black hole the, the Landsat archive has been shrinking. The Hubble archive has really been shrinking. Hubble started out storing data on 12-inch laser disks. Um, the, the room which was assigned for keeping it all, well, Hubble does not create a large amount of data because Hubble takes long exposures. Um, the Sloan is the problem child because that takes huge amounts of data and it's, it's a bother to copy it over. But it's still not, nobody's come up in, in astronomy with an intractable problem yet. The other thing in astronomy, there are very high compaction ratios available. And this is something Hubble looked at and some other people too, because most of it is black. Yeah. So you can come up with lossless compression algorithms. One of the early things they did at Hubble was they worked on progressive transmission algorithms where it's sort of like the way some of the Google images show up where the resolution improves, but the difference is they start with high resolution on the bright objects, the way they've sliced the data, and then they add data planes with more and more dim components. It's basically a quad tree representation. But the, the major concern, more so early on than now, was how to get an image to a user in such a way that he could decide early on whether it was the image he wanted or not to let it go to completion. So you wanted something which was lossless, but also gave most of the queuing information soonest. And you don't get that by just doing low res first because a low res star picture is gray and has no intelligible information. If, if you smear everything out, um, so they, they did the first couple of data planes at fairly high, high resolution so you can identify the field. First of all, did I get the right field? And then progressive transmission and have a stop button. So it was a bi-directional thing that once you started it, you were not committed, but there was a reverse channel going on the network. So you could say, no, this is not what I wanted. Give me something else. It's less of a problem these days because just about everything, everybody has good connectivity, except some of the more distant observatories themselves. Um, but Sloan has solved their problems and um, the next, Space, space sensors will not create the problem because they're limited by downlink. They have to do something smart before they send it down. It's the ground guys. And one of the things I think on one of my lists was, was called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. And that will also be a problem child because that's going to be 747s filled with, with DVDs. Um, the mountaintop does not have comms, does not have a, a adequate comms the for the data comms. rate. Um, so they'll be moving bricks around. Uh, and the intelligent interpretation uh, and the intelligent expectation that the storage densities are continuing to go up. So in all of these, there tends to be a worse time as the data builds up linearly and the storage efficiency increases exponentially. So sometime after you start, you're in the worst place, and then it gets better again. And you just have to plan for that worst case and um, make sure somebody else has got the budget problem for that. Do you have enough PhD candidates in the future to, to go through all that data? <laughs> well, that, that's something, one of the reasons I, I wanted to do this is because it, um, and, and I didn't say it where I meant to in here, given that the classification situation in astronomy is relatively straightforward with intensity as a function of position, time, and, and wavelength. 
the astronomers have done a, a more workmanlike job of addressing it than other disciplines have. And they also, as I said very early on, they don't have the financial motivation to make it ugly. Whereas in Earth remote sensing, there are all kinds of people who want to make the data retrieval problem ugly because they can make money off of it. They want to make it hard. Not everybody, but some of them do. So to some extent, the work that's been done, and I think this is why Microsoft actually was able to support the Worldwide Telescope or wanted to, it becomes a, a good sample case of how to handle big data before they have to face it in more complex scenarios where they have hierarchical data and relationships, complex relationships. I look at two places in the sky, they're almost totally uncorrelated. There's nothing between them. I, I got a star here, I got a galaxy here, that's two completely separate pieces of information for most things. But if I go to the ground and you're in California and I'm here, I may still know you. And big data in civil applications and in remote sensing has many more complex potential connectivities. It's a harder problem. Um, the other reason I like it is I was able to use some of the concepts I picked up from the good observatories in subsequent things I did. I mean, it really, my, my work at the, at the Space Telescope Institute helped my work on the weather satellites because I knew it was not an intractable problem. And yeah, you've got some things that are different, but if you sit down and analyze it systematically, not empirically and say, Oh, I'm, I'm special, I do hurricanes. And somebody else says, I'm special, I do tornadoes. No, you just wind. You know, one way or another, you wind. Just like I can do galaxies and I can do stars because they're just intensity of light. Of light. Hurricanes and tornadoes, I got wind speed, direction, altitude, temperature, humidity, blah, blah, blah. It's a bigger list, but it's still just a list. And if I break it down into good metadata, most of my work is done. And that's a hard sell because everybody wants to look at the data and figure somebody else will take care of the, the indexing. And it's given me a great deal of respect for librarians because they've actually faced this, uh, and I'm not sure if you're aware, but SGML, which is a predecessor of XML and KML and all those, SGML was, was produced by librarians. Um, Ohio Consortium for, um, yeah, Ohio Consortium, OCLC. Uh, the, the guys who produce the, the, uh, the National Library Index. Anyway, it's an organization, OCLC. Comes out of University of Ohio, which has a librarian school. And those guys have faced the fact that a book has a format, a language, a number of pages, a location on the shelf, and an author, a subject, a title. And they said, hey, we have to systematize this. And they were lucky. They only had two solutions, you know, Dewey and Library of Congress. But they figured out a way to make it work together. And they came up with SGML, um, which everybody is bonused off of because they thought through it clearly. So one of the lessons is think through the problem before you start. Uh, to handle the data, and then don't worry, don't, don't ask everybody for their special situations. Because if, if you have a good set of metadata, you'll be able to solve your problem after the fact. I can go on, to med I can go on for metadata for a very long time. Okay, well thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for hanging in. Um, I hope it stays clear. Going to be what it's going to be. I'm going to, I, know. Yeah. I'm not I got my little camera. I'm going to follow Bob's advice and just do it. Let's do it. Let's do it.